Well, good afternoon. Welcome to part four of our webinar series, Sharing Stories and Building Relationships with the Land. Today is the fourth installment in a six part series that runs through June 1st. And my name is Peg Vershawn, and I am the Director of Operations and Programs at CURE, Clean Up the River Environment in Montevideo, Minnesota. The Sharing Stories series grew out of a partnership that was produced um, by our We Are Water West Central Minnesota project this past year. Our shared goal with the series has been to amplify stories of people who are using conservation practices that have important regenerative potential while reducing the impacts of climate change. These practices improve soil health and water quality. They grow deep connections to the land and those who came before them. These stories are from practitioners, people who have boots on the ground and dirt underneath their fingernails. Together, these storytellers come from different backgrounds, cultures, and generations. We are at a critical moment, and we need to hear perspectives from path builders who are catalyzing change for themselves and their communities. Today, we welcome Mark Erickson from the Boss Ridge Ranch near Morris, Minnesota. Mark is going to walk us through what has led he and his family to transition from farming to ranching. What is unique about Mark's journey is that he not only had to get his family on board with this transition to ranching, but he also had to persuade other landowners to allow him to convert their land to pasture to graze his animals on. We're gonna start um, today with a brief uh, video introduction that was uh, filmed for us by a partner named um, Brian DeVore from Land Stewardship Project. He went out and he visited with all of the participants in our series and he shot some video out on their fields so that you as the viewer would get an opportunity to see our participants out in the natural landscape. So I'm gonna share my screen with you and we're gonna uh, watch this brief video. So I'm uh, Mark, Mark Erickson, and the operation that we, we've named our uh, ranch here, the Boss Ridge Ranch. The boss refers to the cattle, and we live on the Continental Divide. So that's the, where the ridge comes from. And we raise uh, grass-fed, grass-finished beef is our sole product on the, on the farm here, along with some chickens and, and uh, other food products. And uh, so uh, I started conventionally farming here in 1994, doing conventional corn, uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, and alfalfa. And uh, in the uh, mid to late uh, 2000s, grain prices were pretty poor, so we transitioned the farm to all grass, all beef. Uh, in 2000, beginning in 2007, and by 2010, we were completely converted to all grass and all beef. And uh, so that's kind of the, been the history of the farm. And so we've been doing this, this grass-fed thing uh, since 98, we, we started experimenting with it and, and uh, have been doing it pretty much full time then since 2010. So we, we've uh, had up to six landlords over the years. And right now, currently we have, we're dealing with four different landowners. And uh, to convert this all to grass, of course, they, they had to uh, agree to that it was going to be a long-term thing because of the fencing. And, and uh, we have 40 some watering locations spread throughout the farm so that the cattle can drink fresh well water basically at all times. And uh, so it's, you know, a fairly extensive uh, infrastructure required. And so it's a long, long-term 
commitment. And so we we had the landowners out here when we were going to start doing this and had a family meeting with them and uh, explained to them what we were going to do. And, and uh, they all agreed to go along with the crazy plan. So now we're converted to all grass and uh, and uh, we're it it's taken about it takes almost 10 years for the grasses to really the land to reestablish itself as grassland which of course this is what what it was before was the tall grass prairie and uh, and of course as a operator you have to get re-educated in how you think about so many different things to to make this work and so we've uh, we've planted uh, this in 2014 we plant re we reestablished 20 acres of the 400 that we farm as uh, native prairie as kind of an experiment to to uh, add diversity to the grazing mix, especially for the finishing cattle. And uh, so, so that's why we have this 20 acres in this corner of the 80 here that's, that's uh, restored native prairie. Wow, it feels good to be um, at this point where we have been working on the series now and we're halfway through, this is, um, our fourth uh, video in the series. I just want to um, thank you, Mark, uh, for being with us today. You know, you in the video refer to yourself as um, an operator because you have a unique set setup compared to the other participants in our series. Um, could you talk a little bit about how much land you own and how much you actually lease for your operation? So we. Uh... We don't actually own any land, so all the land that we operate is leased from uh, several different landlords. Uh, and so when we when we moved here in '94, uh, Delano and Linda Meyer uh, have the base of the operation, and then uh, the Gay Farms uh, had was land was part of the operation, and then uh, also. Uh, Gordon Prickett has a uh, 80 that adjoins here, and then uh, my mother-in-law's uh, Evelyn Rash and and uh, her son David is managing that for. Her. So we have 80 acres near Morris of grassland as well. So we all together we're we're we've got about 450 acres that's uh, in grassland now, and there used to be 50 acres of of uh, permanent pasture when we started. And then as we went along, we started converting uh, steep hillsides and small uh, uneven fields to, to grassland first. And, and then we eventually, the good tillable land we did as well. Great. Um, so in the introductory uh, segment, we um, heard you refer a little bit or um, talk a little bit about the farm crisis and maybe the influence that the farm crisis had on your decision to transition from conventional farming to uh, your grazing operation. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, with, with, with extended period of low prices, especially what there was from the late 1990s through 2008, uh, our machinery was getting older and it, it it didn't seem like there was enough profit there to replace uh, the machinery with new modern more modern machinery and so uh, that's why we looked for a different way so that we could stay in the farming business and with the size of operation we are uh, you can't justify massive ma machinery costs and you but you you need to stay with the times and have uh, equipment that's capable. 
So when you think about um, this transition, um, coming from a farming background, because your family farmed, you grew up in a farming background, um, how hard was it for you to really think of yourself differently from being a farmer to a rancher? Like, who did you have to convince first? And who was the hardest one to convince in this process? Oh, uh, well, you, you have to convince yourself because changing the way you do things and the, uh, going um, on a, a different track than, the, than what the current paradigms are is, it's difficult because you, you tend to, you start off doing things differently and then you're, you've been raised with conventional thinking. So that's one of the struggles is you wind up in the middle. Your part of your operation is is uh, the new ways that you you've uh, learned to adapt and the new technologies that seem to be successful, especially for a moderate sized farm. But then you're always pulled back into your conventional way of thinking because that's the way what you learned in tech school and management for, for many years. And so that's the difficult part because you have, when you're caught in the middle, you have the, the, uh, the expenses of, of both types of farming. And, and so it, it'd be like going to organic farming. You have to pull the shade and move to the new system. And that's, uh, that's, that's a hard thing to do, is to change your conventional type thing. So who did you go to for support? And, and where did you learn about, you know, the, the new ways of thinking about managing soil health? Because I really think that you were ahead of your time. I'm sure your neighbors were looking over the fields and wondering what you were doing wondering, you know, if you were going to be successful at it. So who were those influences in your network or your, your, um, that really helped you take the leap? Well, probably one of the first steps was when I started going to the, the Minnesota grazing conference back in 2000. And, uh, you know, that's changed to the organic conference now. And, you know, that's been a tremendous resource over the years. And of course, the Sustainable Farming Association and Land Stewardship Project and, and other leaders um, like Laverne and Mary Jo Forboard and Don Bev Struxness. I looked at their operations when I was starting and, you know, I saw that they were actually doing this and making it work. And, and, and it looked, the landscape looked and made sense uh, because we struggled here with, with uh, through some wet years and no, not enough tile. And so what happens is, is you've got ground out spots on the other side of good cropland. And so now you have to drive across good cropland to go try and clean the weeds up in this drowned out spot. And uh, none of those spots exist on the farm anymore. There's nothing ever drowns out mm -hmm. because of the changes that we've made. And we've done, so we've done that without having to put in tile. We started putting in some tile, but the cost of it, that was back in, oh, the late nineties. The cost of it with low grain prices at that, at that time just did not make sense. And, so, uh, so, and, and uh, so with that, that kind of uh, influence, if you're going to, to be a moderate sized farm, you've got to really watch your P's and Q's if you're going to make enough money to survive. And that's when you have a, a family that you'd like to see involved in it and, and, uh, Survival is important. 
And I think um, one of the things I'm hearing you talk a little bit about is how uh, weather has impacted that conversion from conventional farmland to pasture. And the work we do at Cure is climate, energy, and water. So we're really interested at the, of the nexus of, of agriculture and climate and uh, the challenges that you are currently facing related to soil health and water management on your property. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, the, the best way to manage grasslands and one of the, the struggles when you're starting that out is you need to plant the grass and then let it rest and get grow strong and get some a good root system. But at the same time, you need to, to get an income off of that land while it's transitioning. And that is a real struggle because you're, you're wanting to leave these plants grow, but you need to harvest them with the cows grazing them. And so you're so that's a trade-off by the harder you graze them, the longer it's going to take the land to build the organic, the soil organic matter and the root structure needed for healthy grassland. And uh, along with all of that goes, uh, the, uh, the, the healthy grassland and the good strong soil biology also releases the minerals. That's one thing that we've seen in the test, the available minerals and uh, that, that are released by the soil biology have improved immensely over, over time. But it's taken 10 years. And if we were to have rested it rested it more and grazed it more intensely when we started it, we would have probably been able to do that in three to five years instead of 10 years. And but in the last couple of years, we really noticed the difference in the, in the grass productivity and the, the, the cattle seem to be a much healthier and more resilient than and the uh, you know the the water holding ability of the soil because uh, you know our soil is now approaching seven percent organic matter so we have much better water holding ability the water doesn't when it rains the water doesn't pass on through the soil structure it's held there so that the grasses don't go dormant when it gets dry and hot and that's that's uh, very beneficial, but the only way you get to that point is by having those healthy grass structures, the diversity, and uh, and the soil organic matter, and, and the rest of the biology working like it's supposed to. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, one of the things that we learn about the grasses is that for the viewers who might not be familiar is with the prairie grasses um, and actually all grasses, typically what you see above ground is about a third of the overall plant because there's about two thirds that's down below the ground in that soil that Mark's talking about where they're, um, the, you're building the soil health and the ability uh, to have uh, live um, microorganisms that are building that soil health, but not only that is that allows when we have a rain event, because with climate change, you know, it's not uncommon for us to get a four inch rain in a short amount of time. In a conventional farm field, you might see that water just sit on top of the, the soil, um, unless it's tiled significantly. Um, in a nice uh, pasture, like the ones you see on Mark's property, the, the soil will just soak up that water and hold it and allow it to stay there and be accessed over time uh, for the, the, the grasses um, to keep his production up for his, his uh, feed. 
And I think that's an important thing that a lot of people don't realize. You know, Mark, yesterday when we were visiting a little bit, you told me two things that I thought were really fascinating and I was really more curious about that I think our viewers would be interested in is you told me about your testing when you first started this process and you were curious to know if raising your steers um, on grass-fed pasture made a difference versus feeding them grain. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, we sent some uh, uh, meat samples into the Agricultural Utilization and Research Institute and had them tested when we first started. Because before I went off on this uh, unusual production method, I wanted to know if what they, some of the claims that they said were actually true. And uh, I was really enthused by the, the, the way the tests came back. The, the high levels of omega-3 that were in the meat, the, so the ratio was about 1.5 to 1, omega-6 to uh, 1.5 1, 1 parts omega-6 to 1 part omega-3, which is uh, supposedly for your healthiest diet is you want to be close to a one-to-one -one, uh, omega balance. And, and of course, once you, once you feed animals a lot of grain, you, you get uh, at least 30 times as much omega-6 as you do in uh, grass-fed animals. And so that, that really in, encouraged me. Uh, and and so they test all the fat components. And the other thing that that I noticed was the the fat component components seem to be very balanced because there's like 20 different components of fat that they test. I I think that's really amazing, and uh, it's important uh, when we think about healthy diets and when we think about you know animals what they're designed. Uh, to eat because a lot of times our, our current production methods of food alter the natural sequence of food uh, alignment for the animals that we're using in our production. And so when you were sharing that yesterday, I thought that that was a really important thing and, and that there are ways to get your uh, meat tested and find out uh, what those ratios look like for yourself as a farmer. So I thought that was really a great thing. And then yesterday you also were sharing with us um, some things that you've been thinking more hard about uh, or more serious about related to your grazing methods. And we were talking mostly about, I had asked you the question about how do, do you have, do you end up having to um, intercede sometimes your pastures to make them a little bit more robust. And um, we got off uh, talking about um, the quality of the pasture and the the forage that comes up and how you, the things that you're experimenting with right now. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, we, you, you always make mistakes and the, the, the weather goes against you. And when you've got a large group of cattle uh, and it rains for three weeks, they are going to damage your pasture. There's no doubt about it. And so we used to fix some of that and thin areas by no tilling and adding in new grasses. But of course, that's, that helps. But when you are planting a new, a new little seed lane into an established pasture, it has a real tough time competing. So, and because we're, and because when you, when you add those plants in, you're doing it with a no-till drill. So it's all about the timing. And in nature, timing is, is everything. And so when you do it with a no-till drill, you have to go get the no-till no drill and rent it, and you have to seed it and then take it back. And so the, the timing is when you've got the seed, when you've got the time, when the ground is dry enough and when you're able to rent the drill. In, in nature, if you can let your pastures, your healthy pastures reseed themselves, then the seeding gets done in nat by nature's timing. 
And, uh, and I believe that's a much more effective way to do that. So, so to allow nature to reseed those pastures, uh, there's, there's two things that can happen. You can graze your pastures too hard and the only plants that are left that get big enough to go to seed are the ones that the cattle don't like. So you don't want, you don't want the results of that in your pasture. So what, what we've done more of, and they're, and they're experimenting with it, we start out in the spring by what I call flash grazing. So moving the cattle quickly through and try to re remove like two thirds of the seed head so that you can maintain quality in your pasture, but that you move them quick enough so that you leave some of the good plants to be able to go to seed and don't, don't bring them cattle back until they've, the seed is matured. And so using strategies to, to, uh, to allow the, your, your pastures to the healthy plants that you desire, the desirable plants to recede themselves by nature's way, uh, that, that, that's just another one of those things that we're all finding out is discovering how we can work with nature to, to make that work instead of trying to force our own way, way onto it. And because when we try to do it our way, it's more expensive and not as effective. You know, um, your comments about letting nature, following nature's way, uh, you also talked a little bit about that with your herd and calving. Can you uh, speak to that a little bit and share your uh, wisdom over time related to calving? Well, when we, when we started calving, this is the this is a, an example of the conventional thinking that's, so we started in 94 with the heifers calf January 24th. And uh, it was 24 below several nights when we were calving those heifers. And uh, so the next year we moved to February 9th and then we, we moved about uh, 10 days ahead every year for many years. And, uh, and then we kind of settled on having an April, but you know, like this April is a perfect example. Uh, they, they, it's still a hard time to calve even in April. And in nature, you know, the bison and the deer, they, they have their young in late April, May and June. And so last year, hopefully this all, all works uh, and I think it will. Uh, we changed our calving dates now, so we're going to calve in May and June. And we also tried fall calving, so we split the herd and did fall calving, but that added so much complexity because, you know, you've got, you're weaning twice a year, you're, you're uh, working the calves four times a year, it just adds too much complexity to it, and then you're going against nature again because... In the fall, all them coyote pups need to learn how to kill something. And it turns out killing baby calves is. And so we've got uh, from our fall calving herd yet, which was two years ago, we pretty much quit that. We've still got some short tailed calves in the herd that the coyotes chewed the, ta the, the tails right off of. And so. So I'm really determined to stick with this May and June calving now. And, and, I, and I believe that's gonna be very beneficial. And, and again, it will reduce cost and reduce complexity so that we can spend our time on other more important things. Well, I think nature has a way of gently reminding us that we're either working too hard or we're working against ourselves, right? And that's a perfect example of uh, looking to nature to realize that you're out of alignment and maybe it would make more sense to, to think differently. And, 
you know, I'm sure there's reasons why people calve in, in February, March, and April. If you're a conventional farmer, you need to be out in the fields, but you're in a unique situation now that you don't have to be out in the fields because you've got your pasture, that it does make more sense um, and less work for you. So that I think that that's a win-win in, in your case. Um, I'm going to steer the conversation back a little bit more to this um, unique thing that you bring to the mix. And, and that's this uh, relationship that you have with multiple landowners to allow you to graze their property. And, and you really, um, you had to find people that were willing to rent to you and allow you to convert their, their land to pasture so that it was good forage for your, your animals. And I think that that our listeners today are a little bit curious about maybe the process that you went through. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about some of the folks that you work with and, you, you know, whether you met them through other networks or family, but I'm guessing that you had to strategize a little bit and uh, maybe invite them out. Could you talk a little bit about that process that you went through to cultivate them, to think about conservation, to think about going back to pasture? Well, um, the, the landowners have, have been through quite a bit of uh, agricultural history. So they experienced the, the, uh, the wonders of the late 70s and early 80s and then the disaster as the 80s progressed and, and uh, farmers got in big financial problems. And so, uh, you, they they have a great deal of experience, and I think uh, I think all of them. I just fortunate enough to to get involved with this group when Delano and Linda uh, went to be missionaries. That uh, we uh, uh, got to work with this group of landowners, and Delano had, had always been a conservation minded, and so. That's that's part of it. Is this this group of landowners has always been, uh, to my way of thinking, conservation minded, and and uh, and I think they have a, a a land use ethic. They like to see the family on the land, and so you know that requires a commitment. And so so back in. There, there's been various times uh, over the history that uh, in the early, the early 2000s, I let some of the tillable land go from, from uh, one of the landowners because, uh, because of the equipment issue and so on. And I kept the rough land and the, the, uh, the highly erodible hillsides and so on, and 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 have made that into permanent pasture. So, so the land use on that part of the land is probably what it should be. And uh, so, when we started doing that, so we started that process. Actually, must have been around two thousand. And uh, so. Then you're going to make these major decisions. How do you do this? And I had decided that I wasn't going to buy new equipment, and so it was more or less, you know, we either do this this intensive pasture grazing thing, or we quit. And uh, so I had a meeting with them, and uh, uh, Gordon and Jean and Jim Gay and and Delno and Linda and. Uh, they were all here. We spent the day and we, we went out and I showed them what I, where I intended to put the fences and what I intended to do with the, the uh, water and so on. And, and, uh, and you know, they had to sign a, a commitment that this was going to re remain in pasture for 20 years. And so, uh, uh, I got a very positive res response from that, and and that's how we came came to 
move forward with all of this. You were building the relationship with them and um, not only talking to them about the process, but you actually brought them out to look at the process. And I think that aesthetic of actually being out in the field and, and being on the spot, it makes it hard not to want to do what's best for the land. Cause I think that's what you're really doing. You're thinking about the land and the water and the legacy that you're leaving. And, um, you know, you talk about the generations or the decades of, of challenges and fighting to uh, maintain the land and maintain a way of life. And in some ways you're just surrendering to nature in many ways. Um, and, and trying to do what's best for nature. And if you take care of the natural world, the natural world will take care of you. And that seems to be what's happening for you and your family is the hard work that you've put in to protect the land and the water is really, you know, taking care of you and the animals in return. I, I think um, it's kind of a symbiotic relationship. It's, it's really evident by listening to you talk, you know, one of the other things yesterday that was interesting to me was uh, some of the new things that you're experimenting with related to water. You talked about how you started with permanent water holes on your property um, and what you're moving to now. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, w when we started uh, putting the, the fences and grazing systems in, they were, we were doing what was called rotational grazing. So that is basically a set number of paddocks and a water tank in each paddock, a permanent water tank in each paddock. But part of what happens is the, uh, the, the most of the manure gets in the area of the water tank and the, the grass gets beat up the worst there. And so we're moving away from the permanent watering locations and adding extra water lines so that we can move the tanks more so we can concentrate the... Uh... My goal is to have no black dirt, no, no mud holes by water tanks so that it's all in healthy pasture plant. And and to do that, you need to spread those water, move those watering locations so that the, the, the land is very resilient. If you give it a chance, you can beat it up, but if you give it, a, and, but if you don't do it for too long and you give it a chance to rest and recuperate, it comes back uh, unbelievably well. In fact, um, in the areas that are trampled the worst will become the healthiest if they're, they're not trampled uh, for a long period of time. So that if the cattle are only there for two days or so, and then they're moved, those areas may look like a plowed field in a rain event, but six weeks later, they will be the best grassland you have. And so, so the ability of plants to recover if you keep the cattle moving. And then of course, the, the newest way of grazing now is, is uh, using less fencing and actually is hurting cattle. And uh, well, we're not ready yet to go out and stand there and keep the cattle where, standing where we want them by herding every day yet. So we're using, going to use the, the, the watering source and the mineral source along with fencing uh, to, to try to keep these cattle uh, concentrated in the areas they need to be instead of going by a set grazing plan. The, the new way of doing it is, is to keep moving the cattle to the place on the farm that they need to be today. And and so, so that's, it, it's, a, it's a changing idea all the time. And, uh, but by doing that, you will again, increase your production of, of beef and improve the quality of your, 
your grasses and your animals. You know, Mark, um, every time I listen to you talk, I learn something new. It's kind of interesting. Uh, and I really appreciate everything you're sharing today. Uh, one of the things we have the ability to do is to take questions from the participants. And so if you're interested in submitting a, a question to Mark, you can go to the chat and type it in and I'll try to get to as many of those as I can. There are a few questions there. So are you up for that, Mark? Can I ask you a couple? Sure. Okay. So one of the questions uh, comes from Troy and he wants to know how you've been able to involve your family in the work on your ranch over time. Well, they've always uh, been a key part of it. And uh, so I have a daughter and three sons. And I have 10, 10 grandsons and, and a granddaughter. And, and they, they range from a couple months old to 28. And so there's, there's all, always somebody changing what they're doing and at diff, different stages and so on but they've always been a key part of it. And, you know, it's a part of what I, it, having uh, an operation like this requires lots of help sometimes. And of course, the good part of that is when you have help here, you're, you're together and you're doing things together. And so, uh, you know, Andy has been working with me for several years and and uh, it's it's gotten to the point where now I have to tr try to train myself to just step back and let him let him sort the cattle because he can do it better than I can. And <laughs> and of course uh, having Adam uh, working with the soil and water, uh, he's always adds a level of understanding that you know it's. You know, having someone who understands what you're doing is is very important, and and so he adds a a level of uh, confidence and and helps me see new things and think of new ways to do things, and and uh, and then of course all the other family me members each make their own contributions, and of course my wife Deb, she has to keep this all organized and keep this mob fed when all this work is happening. So <laughs> that's, uh, it, it's all, it's all the way I think life should be. And so if we can, the main thing is to survive so we can continue to do this and, and figure out the, the right way to do it. And that's, that's the difficult part. You know, you've talked about a, some of the programs that you've used. Um, you know, you talk about having Adam at the SWCD, which he in Stevens County, which he actually, you know, might have a line to new programs that are coming out. But are there other agencies or programs that you've used outside of the SWCD that have helped you or the other landowners transition the land? Well, of course, the, the NRCS equip program has been been uh, really really helpful, and their their expertise is is uh, is so important because they they have many really dedicated employees that I, I feel, and their expertise has been really helpful, and and uh, and of course they. Their, the cost share and putting in fences and watering and uh, is you wouldn't you you'd have a hard time doing that on on your own and we're doing more, some of that on our own now because uh, we have we've figured out how to make fences cheaper than we used to and and uh, and we have the the equipment and tools to do it so. Uh, and then, of course, the the land stewardship and the Sustainable Farming Association and the Minnesota Organic uh, Conference, uh, the uh, 
conferences that they put on and the field days that they put on are absolutely essential to shorten up your learning curve because that's the hardest part of all of this is is gaining an understanding and having the confidence to go go forward with with changes it just it's just like cover crops we're just starting to go back to using some annual cover crops as a way to improve our poorest pastures and so you know that 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 takes getting that level of understanding which you get from working with others who are trying different things you, you know how many how many things do you have to try to have a, have a, one great success you know more 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 businesses fail every year than become successful and it's the same thing with trying new things you have to have all of these people out out there trying trying these new things and then saying that didn't work and then why didn't it work you know the first time we did cover crops first couple of times were a complete failure and um, so uh, I was at a field day over at, at Jim Wolf's and and he said the way that you make cover crops work is you manage them with the same in intent and passion as you do a cash corn crop so you think about that. Most people, when they're going to do a cover crop, well, they'll throw some seed out there and see if it grows. No, you have to plant it at the right depth. You have to make sure it has the fertility and the water to grow. And you have to uh, nurse it along and help plant it at the right time. And so that, that's where you learn these things is at these events, you, you learn uh, short shortens your learning curve. I uh, continually feel like the thread that we get through these webinars is building relationships with your neighbors and uh, those organizations out there that um, you know that you listed off certainly help bring people together and share good ideas, problem solve. I also hear a lot of uh, adventure or um, initiative, being willing to try new things and being open-minded. Because I think sometimes people can worry about what other people are thinking they're doing. And um, certainly uh, through our relationship of getting to know you, I've really appreciated that you have a linear side to what you're doing. You analyze, you look at things, you measure them, you determine the financial viability, you know, whether that's the influence of your father. You had mentioned, I think yesterday, I don't know if the, the viewers know, but your dad was an accountant and gave you some maybe number skills that might not always be available to people in this, in this work. Um, or at least just the growing up with someone that's a numbers person gives you the idea um, about how to process information and weigh um, and balance the, the pros and cons to, to, to decide if you're going to take that risk. Um, so I've really appreciated that sense of adventure. Um, we're kind of coming towards the end of our, our time today. So I, I want to be able to just take a minute to thank you um, and your family, Mark, for sharing your story with us. I also would like to thank a couple of our partners in this work. Uh, this project really came about through a grant opportunity through the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships at the University of Minnesota Extensions. And Troy Goodnow from the Office of Sustainability at the University of Minnesota Morris was one of our We Are Water partners. Um, and he, he said, there's this opportunity maybe to look at how water in our watershed is being managed and you know we know that the the quality of water and um how water moves on the land is deeply impacted by agriculture and uh this was an opportunity to reach out to some partners in the in the watershed that are doing things a little bit differently 
than um, maybe their neighbors. And so, Mark, you certainly are one of those people that we wanted to lift up and tell the story about how you work with being an operator and um, converting conventional land to pasture. Another partner in this work is Judy Johnston at the Stevens County Soil Water District. Um, Mark re referenced land stewardship a couple times. Uh, Brian DeVore actually went out and filmed all of the segments for our webinar series. And Robin Moore from the Montevideo Office of Land Stewardship Project. She was part of, uh, you know, thinking about this, this concept and helping us develop it. We want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, there are over 35 people on the call today, so we appreciate for you spending your lunch hour with us. We want to be sure to invite you to join us on Tuesday, May 11th, where Carrie Redden from the 12 Tells Farm near Chicago, uh, Minnesota, is going to share her story with us. These webinars... Um, are going to be available to you through either the CURE website um, or the CURE YouTube channel. They'll be uh, stored there and um, we'll do a little bit of editing of today's webinar and the previous three webinars are there um, for you to check out and share and, and view if you'd like. We just want to thank you, um, Mark, once again, and your family for opening up your farm uh, ranch to us. And uh, we wish you the best of luck. And we'd like to uh, thank everyone for joining us and have the great rest of your day. We'll see you on the 11th. Bye-bye. Yep. Thank you as well.